<clears throat> this evening, if, if I uh, can, uh, well, if I may, well, if I may, I'd like to begin reading from verse 27. I'm not sure if that's what I had said, but if we could read from verse 27 through verse 36, because really most of what we're going to be looking at are in those verses rather than in verse 35. <clears throat> So Luke chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in verse 27, and I'll read through verse 36. Uh, Jesus, again in this, uh, what may be called the Sermon on the Plain, could be Luke's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, doesn't really matter. Certainly it's parallel in many ways, but he says this, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. May the Lord uh, bless His Word to our hearing this evening, and may He also give us the grace to be able to do what it is He calls us here to do. Now, this morning, remember, we saw five reasons. Jesus gave us five reasons, really, in just verse 35, uh, why we should do what we've already seen and know by experience is arguably the most difficult thing the Lord calls us to do as His children, and that is not to seek revenge, but to love those who hate us, to love our enemies, to return good for the evil that people deal out to us. Now, we saw that we should do this because this is what Jesus calls us to do, and certainly He is our Lord. He has the right to do this. And, of course, we should do it because of His grace and His love. And we were warned this morning again, or at least reminded, what the Apostle uh, Paul reminds us of, at least in another context, that we should not sin that grace may abound. And in this case, we should not trade upon the mercies of our Lord to excuse us from this duty. It's so easy to do that. I mean, we are going to make it to heaven if we're trusting in Jesus, even if we fail miserably. It doesn't matter how badly we fall, but that should never be an excuse not to do the very best that we can do for Him. We do need to remember we owe Him our lives. We owe Him all the love that we have to give we owe Him everything that He would ever call us to do. We should love our enemies, secondly, because this is what our Father does. Jesus reminds us that mankind is evil. And again, it may not appear that way, but it does under certain circumstances, but perhaps under common grace circumstances, it may not appear that way, but it is. God created man other than that. He made him good, but His choice left him in this condition evil and ungrateful, and yet the Father continually pours out His good gifts on all mankind, good and bad alike, because God does what is right. And that, Jesus says, is what He wants us to imitate. We should love our enemies because when we do this, we actually show ourselves to be His children. Remember, children share in the nature of their, their father or their parents. Uh, we don't share in His divinity, but we do share in His moral likeness. That's what it means to be partakers of the divine nature. 
we are like Jesus morally. We are like the Father morally. And when we do what they do, the Father shows his kindness to the ungrateful and to the evil. Jesus obviously does the same thing. When we do that as well, we show that we really are born of God. We really do partake of that nature. We really are like them. We should love our neighbor because the Lord says that he will reward us if we do this, or we should love our enemy, our neighbor, actually all of our neighbors, but particularly our enemies. And the Lord actually singles us out as something that he will not only reward us for, but greatly reward us for. And perhaps it's because this, above all other things, most clearly reflects who he is and what he is like. And it's also, as we understand from this morning, what the Lord uses to bring other people to himself. He shows them patience, forbearance, kindness, and it's all meant to lead them to repentance. I believe he wants us to show them the same thing, to show them that same witness so that the Lord might use us to bring others to himself. And we should love our enemies because, perhaps most importantly and most personally, this is the way the Father loved us when we were his enemies. This is the way that Jesus loved us when we were his enemies. He showed us mercy while we were yet enemies. He sent Jesus to die for us. As we have been shown mercy, the Lord says he wants us to show mercy. Again, Jesus says in Luke 6, 35 and 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father uh, is merciful. Now this evening, what I'd like us to do is to consider how Jesus tells us that we are to love our enemies. Um, he does say a little bit about it in verse 35, but Obviously, he tells us quite a bit more in our text. But before we begin, I thought it would be interesting, maybe even a little bit enlightening, to um, bring a couple of things that we recently heard uh, from our studies in the upper room. Remember, lessons from the upper room, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, on, on Wednesdays, that perhaps, again, might mm, cause us to um, make a bit more sense and maybe show a little bit more why it is we ought to do these things. Uh, we, the first principle that I wanted to bring in is what we saw last week where Jesus said if, to Philip, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And then the second one, a few weeks ago, where we should not only want others to treat us the way we want to be treated, but understanding that Jesus has treated us the way that we really should be treated, we should treat others the way he has treated us. Now, I want to use them in this way, uh, considering that one of the reasons Jesus came into the world was to reveal the Father, to show us what he's like. John writes in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. This is interesting, uh, the, the idea that Jesus here is called the only begotten God, we know him to be the eternally begotten Son of God. There was never a time when he did not exist, but he's eternally begotten of the Father and so forth. He is on the earth, and yet he says that he is in the bosom of the Father, which I think many take to understand that Jesus was still as the Son of God just as much with the Father in heaven as he ever was, but now he is also on earth. But the point is he came down to earth in order to explain the God which no one had actually ever seen. He wanted to exegete him, to reveal him, to show us what he's like. And the way that he showed us the Father was mainly in the way that he lived. Uh, when Philip, and again, this is in um, John 14, verses 8 through 9, the upper room. When Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us, Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, a couple of things here. Jesus is not saying he is the Father, but what he is saying is he came to reveal the Father. 
But the way that he did it is, again, by the way he lived. Notice Jesus says to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So if we want to know how the Father wants us to love our enemies, how he would do it if he were here, all we really need to do is look at Jesus because Jesus is doing exactly what the Father would do. He, he and the Father are one in purpose, they're one in character, and they would do precisely the same thing, whether it be the Father or the Son in that human nature. There was a time when we were his enemies and he showed us love. You know, he treated us, okay, not simply how we want to be treated, but as we needed to be treated. So Jesus then is revealing to us how the Father would love us if, if we were here, and the way that he treated us, which is the second principle, is how he wants us to treat others. We're to follow the example of Jesus. So basically these two principles, Jesus reveals the Father, and Jesus is in loving us, is showing us how the Father wants us to love others, treat others the way that Jesus has treated you. And when Jesus said this, we do need to understand he raised the command to an even higher level in the way we are to love our enemies. We are to love them as Jesus loved his enemies. So as we go through this particular section and we look at how it is we are to show kindness to our enemies, we do need to consider Jesus and how Jesus did these things so that we might better know how it is we are to do them uh, for others. And then one last thing I want us to bear in mind is, again, the last thing. Remember the idea of um, the, the reward, uh, the idea that there's a greater reward for loving our enemies. Why? Uh, perhaps it's because... This is the witness the Lord wants us to use in order to bring others to Him. So something He prizes, something He treasures, something He really wants us to do. So as we go through this section, we need to remember that Jesus is, is, has loved us as His enemies with the goal of bringing us into fellowship with His Father and to make us like Him by His Holy Spirit so that we might go out and do the same thing he did, that we might love our enemies with the goal of bringing them to Jesus so that they might have fellowship with the Father and that by his grace they too might become like him and in the process be transformed from our enemies to our friends. And that is the ultimate goal, isn't it? Jesus loved his enemies. When we were his enemies, he loved us and he made us friends. As we go out to love our enemies and to show them love, by God's grace, they may be transformed from enemies to friends. And not just our friends, but the friends of the Lord, which is the ultimate goal. So let's consider then how we are to love our neighbor. And, I, and to begin with, I, I just want us to um, take a look at what Jesus means when he tells us that we are to love them. Now, the word, I mentioned this this morning, and I told you I was going to come back to it this evening. The word that he uses here is maybe surprisingly, maybe not, but it's the word agape, or it's more technically, it's the verb agapao. And the fact that it is can be a bit confusing because of the way we usually think of this word. We think of it, of course, as the highest kind of love that exists, and certainly it, it is, but it has couple of different directions, we might say. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that there are at least three words in the Greek that can be translated to love, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but I think it helps us to understand this kind of love better if we understand what the other two are like. The first word is the word eros, which refers to love, but it is a love of desire for something a desire that is typically a self-centered desire, which is why it is often translated lust. We use that word in our English. I mean, we, use, we have one word. We call it love, and we use it in a variety of ways. And if we say, I love hot dogs, this is kind of what we're talking about. Or we could even mean that when we say, I love this individual, or I love that individual. I desire them for myself because I want them, you see. 
So that's what the word eros means, and that's not the word, of course, that the Lord is using here. The second word is phileo, which refers to a love that is based upon our association with other people, like the love that we would have for the, those in our family, for a father or mother, sister, brother, those that we have with the friends that we associate with. You know, we love them, we care about them. Uh, the love that, um, well, that we might have, again, in any particular society where we form these attachments. Uh, this word is, is the word from which we get the name of the city Philadelphia. I'm sure you've heard that before. Uh, phil or phila, or actually it's the phil part of it is the phileo part, and Adelphia. Uh, actually, that seems um, feminine now that I think about it, but usually this is translated the city of brotherly love. It's this kind of love we would have for a family. But agape is a greater love. It's the love that Jesus was calling Peter to. Remember in the end of John's gospel, Peter, do you agape me? Jesus, you know that I phileo you. You know that I love you like a brother. Jesus, Jesus says again, you know, Peter, do you, do you love me with this, this highest form of love? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you with a brotherly affection. And then Jesus says the third time, Peter, do you love me with this brotherly affection you keep talking about? And, and then Peter was grieved because he said the third time, brotherly affection instead of this highest form of love. And uh, he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you with a brotherly affection. Now, Jesus wants us to love him, of course, with this agape love. It is the highest form of love. But here's where we need to basically put on our thinking caps for a bit because we need to understand that this word uh, can refer to either a love that one has for something or someone that draws that love out. In other words, the object is so, is so wonderful that we have a supreme love for it. It's the kind of love actually that we should have for the Father. It's the love we should have for the Son. It's the love we should have for the Holy Spirit and by the Holy Spirit because they are worthy of that love. The object draws out our affections. It's the love that we should have for our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ as they share, as we all share that same moral image that makes the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit so lovely. That is one sense in which the word uh, agape is used, but it can also be used in this way. It can refer to the strength of love that one can show another. The greatest and most sacrificial kind of love that is not self-centered but others-centered, such as the love that God showed the world when he sent his son into the world so that all who believe might be saved. Now think about this for a minute. God did not look at the world and saw so much beauty and so much desirability that his heart was drawn out to the world and he had to send his son into the world because the world was not lovely to him. We saw this morning the world was just the opposite. They hated him. Uh, ungrateful, evil, that doesn't draw out love. That draws out wrath. So it wasn't that. Rather, he showed the world the strength of his love in the face of unthankful and evil hearts by sending his son into a world like that and offering him to all men so that whoever believes in him might be saved. It wasn't the, the beauty or the strength of the beauty of the object that drew God's heart out to them, but it was the strength of love in his heart that he gave something sacrificially in order to meet a very real need that was present in the world. Now, I say that because the same is true here with regard to our loving our enemies. God does not call us to love them for their beauty. We're not going to be able to love them because we find them to be lovely. If they're enemies, we actually find them to be just the opposite. The Lord wants us to love them because he has put a love in our hearts that gives us the ability to love the unlovely in the same way that the Father loved the world and sent His Son into the world. Now, it is a love then that goes beyond the kind of love that the world has. And Jesus describes what that love is in verses 32 through 34. 
of Luke chapter 6. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to re receive back the same amount. Sometimes we define love in this way. And what Jesus is saying is that this is no more, uh, well, th this, this is something that those who are ungrateful and evil can do. This is something that is self-centered. Uh, it's giving in order to receive back. It's loving in order to be loved back. Jesus wants us to have a higher kind of love. He wants us to love with a love that actually costs us something, even as it costs him and the Father in their love towards their enemies. It cost Jesus' life. It cost him, all, cost him all that suffering. It cost the Father what was most precious to him. It cost him his son. Now, this is the kind of love that will stop traffic. This is not the kind of love the world is used to. This is the kind of love that will mark us out as being the Lord's. And it's the kind of love that he will use to draw others to himself. So what does that love look like? I think you already know enough about it. We could probably just stop here. But Jesus does tell us a few things about it, and I think it would be helpful for us to look at it briefly. First, he says in verse 27, this is, this is what it looks like. Do good to those who hate you. Instead of hating those who hate you, do good to them instead. And what he means is do something that is useful, something that is helpful, something that provides for a need. Try to meet their needs if they have a need. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If they need help, help them. If they're without Christ, share the gospel with them. Give to meet their needs. Now, I think it goes without saying that that is the one thing we saw about the Father this morning. He's kind to ungrateful and evil men. How is he? He gives. He shows his kindness by doing good to all. He provides food. He provides rain. He provides sun. Everything that they need, God gives. When Jesus ministered on earth, his ministry was characterized by doing good. This is the very thing Peter pointed out when he was preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his household. He says in Acts 10, 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And let's not forget who these people were that he was doing good to, the people that he undoubtedly knew would shortly after turn on him and would call out for his crucifixion. Jesus was loving his enemies by doing good. This is what the Lord wants us to do. It's hard. You know, again, we want to return hatred, hatred with hatred. We, we want to retaliate, but the Lord says the only thing we can retaliate with, the only thing that we can repay their hatred with is good. Secondly, he says in verse 28, bless those who curse you. Now, we might be tempted to think that what he means here is that those people that say, you know, use four-letter words, nasty words, curse us in that way, and, and certainly there are people who will do that. And when they do that, we should not retaliate, but we should bless them. But what he actually has in mind here is literally a curse. The word means to call on God or on some false deity in order to call down some judgment or some, some evil thing on someone else to hurt them. Jesus, on one occasion, cursed, but he cursed a fig tree. And when he did, it withered. Essentially, he called down a curse upon it. May there no longer be any fruit on you. And the tree just withered at once. So in other words, he called upon God to curse that particular tree. Maybe the closest analogy would be an imprecation. An imprecation, we see these imprecations in the Old Testament Psalms, and sometimes we wonder what to do with these things, where David writes, Lord, crush their teeth, break their arms, uh, destroy them, utterly ruin them, let, let their children be fatherless. I mean, just all these different things. Lord, do this to them. 
Now, perhaps there are instances where that needs to be done, but Jesus here is telling us that if somebody curses us, then we need to bless them instead. We're not to pray imprecations. That shouldn't be the first thing we, we, we reach for. But call instead upon God to bless them. That's essentially, instead of calling upon God to curse them when they curse us, instead we call upon God to grant them a blessing instead. Now think about when Jesus was going through his sufferings on the cross. What were his enemies saying about him? This man who claims to be the Son of God, let him come down if he's the Son of God. We'll believe in him. They were ridiculing him and they were considering him to be cursed of God. They may not have necessarily have called down a curse, at least not on that occasion, although I, I would think on other occasions they certainly did. But even so, Jesus did not curse in return. The Lord, describing this through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53, 4, says this, Surely our griefs, our griefs, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah almost seems to, well, he puts himself in the place of those Jews who were standing around ridiculing him. You know, it was our griefs he was bearing, our sorrows he was carrying, but yet we considered him cursed by God. But you see, instead of cursing them in return, Jesus prayed for a blessing. Father, forgive them. You, they don't know what they're doing. Now, Jesus was not asking that the Father would, continue, would, would forgive them if they continue in their ways and to bless them even though they were living in rebellion against Him. But I think what Jesus was praying was that God, by His grace, might mercifully turn them from their sins to believe on Him and be saved. That's the only way anybody can be forgiven. So that's the way we need to understand what Jesus was praying. So they cursed, but Jesus blessed in return. When others desire to harm us, to hurt us, when they hate us, when they curse at us, and maybe if there are those who would actually call upon some either God, the true God, or some false God to curse us, if that may happen in some instances, instead of asking God to curse them and destroy them, we should desire their good and ask God to have mercy on them. Pray for them that God might lead them graciously to repentance and to do it from the heart. You see, that's the hard part is because that's not what our hearts would desire if they've injured us. But this is what the love of God will enable us to do, to be sons of the Most High. This is what He does. Now, Jesus says, thirdly, pray for those who mistreat you. And I think it's very similar to the previous one, perhaps why they're grouped together. But when someone insults you or treats you poorly, don't get angry. Don't desire to hurt them in return, but pray to the Father that he might bring them to repentance. And again, I would point to Jesus. He was mistreated. He was rejected. He was beaten. He was ridiculed. He was nailed to a cross, which to the Jews meant he was, again, cursed. Cursed is everybody who is nailed to the tree. But he prayed. And he asked that the Lord might have mercy upon them. We are to pray for those who mistreat us that the Lord might have mercy on them and lead them to repentance. Now, he says forth in verse 29, whoever hits you in the cheek, offer him the other also. You know, turn the other cheek. If somebody actually uh, strikes you physically, if somebody does it metaphorically in the sense of insulting you or injuring you, again, the law of no retaliation. But rather, Jesus says, don't line up at his cheek and hit him. But instead, turn the other cheek and prepare yourself for further insults, for further injuries. Prepare yourself to bear whatever abuse they might want to dish out. And I don't think Jesus means that if they're going to use you as a punching bag, you need to stand there until they pummel you to death. But it's talking about, I think, you know, again, the idea of somebody's going to injure you. Just don't retaliate, but bear up under it within reason. He doesn't want us to break the Sixth Commandment. Now, wherever Jesus went, and perhaps this would be a good example, He was constantly under attack by the scribes, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. They all hated Him. They all wanted to kill Him, particularly the Jews in Jerusalem, 
because he had healed a man on the Sabbath. And yet, what did Jesus do? Did he attack them at every corner whenever he saw them, point them out? Uh, there, I mean, there does reach a point, and perhaps this is where imprecations come in again. Jesus was patient, and he was kind, and it did reach a point where he finally did pronounce a curse upon them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. That actually is an imprecation. That actually is a curse. But for the most part, Jesus patiently bore it, and he never retaliated until it was, well, the, the Father's will that he do, and he pronounced that curse upon them. And, of course, we know it fell upon them in 70 A.D. Now, our first reaction when somebody injures us is to get even, to do to them what they did to us so that they can feel what we feel. Uh, but we need to bear with them and not get even with them, but instead be patient in the hopes that the Lord might uh, bring them to repentance and, again, pray for them. Fifthly, he says, whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt. If somebody takes your outer garment, your coat, don't, you know, don't withhold your shirt, your inner garment from them. And I think Jesus here likely has a lawsuit in mind because an outer garment was often used as a surety for certain things. And if somebody takes it away and then demands something more, he says, let them have it. Don't, don't resist. Don't fight back. Uh, Gill, John Gill in his commentary uh, writes this, the sense is if a wrangling quarrelsome man insists upon having your coat or upper garment, let him take the next and rather allow yourself to be stripped naked <laughs> than engage in a litigious broil with him. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, why not rather be wronged? You know, why not rather be defrauded? And that even among brethren rather than resisting and fighting and bringing that battle before unbelievers and turning people away from the gospel, you see. So there are times when we just simply need to bear with it because of the good that's going to come out of it. There was an occasion where Jesus could have refused to pay a tax that they were insisting that he pay. Remember, he asked Peter, Peter, to, from whom do these collect this tax? Yeah, from sons or from foreigners? And he said, from foreigners. He said, the sons are exempt. We're sons. We don't have to pay this. But so that we don't create an offense, let's pay the tax. And, of course, he did it in a supernatural way. He had Peter throw in a line, and the first fish that came up found a stator and used it to pay both of their taxes rather than um, resisting and creating, you know, something that would have, well, that, that could have turned out poorly for the cause of the gospel, Jesus was willing rather to yield to what they were seeking to do, to take away something they had no right to. Jesus gave it to them. He did that because of the greater issues at stake, because of his Father's glory. So for the sake of peace, for the sake of the testimony of the gospel, it's better to be wronged than to resist the one who is wronging us. I mean, Jesus didn't even resist the unjust taking away of his life in order that he might give honor to his father. Take my life if it, it's, you know, if it can save my people, and, and certainly it could, and it did. Sixthly, Jesus says, give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Now, this one I think we often kind of wonder about. Um, give to everyone who asks of you. There's a lot of people asking, you know, for money and for things. Does that mean we need to give to everybody who comes up to us and asks? I was talking with uh, someone today, and we were talking about you know, the, the scenario. Somebody comes up to you and says, do you have any spare change? And so you give them your spare change, and then they ask you, do you have any spare bills? And, and if you say no, then they curse at you. Okay, now the question is, should you have given that person your spare change? Well, see, here's the question. Is Jesus telling us here that if, if I come to any one of you and I say, give me some money, uh, you're supposed to give it to me? Um, I don't think so. Because he tells us elsewhere through the Apostle Paul that if a person does not work, he shouldn't also eat so that his hunger will move him to work instead of getting other people to take care of him. So if a person is able to work but is unwilling to work, then we're not supposed to help that kind of person until he's willing to work. So what is Jesus actually saying here? Well, I think he's saying give to those people who ask of you who really have need. 
those who cannot provide for themselves. The Lord certainly cares about those who can't provide for themselves, particularly orphans and widows. He sent Elijah to take care of the widow of Zarephath during the time of the famine. Jesus, as he ministered throughout Israel, throughout Palestine, continually responded to requests for help, for healing. And actually, I think we can assume they also gave money to the poor. Remember when Jesus sent Judas out of the upper room, the disciples thought that Jesus had told them to go give some money to the poor, so that was something that they were also uh, doing. So Jesus says, when there is somebody in need who is asking of you, give to that person who is in need, even if they happen to be an enemy. And then the second part of this where he says, whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. There's two different views on what he means here. It, it could have to do with if somebody steals something from you, don't demand it back. But if that's the case, I mean, that could be the case. You know, just let them have it. Let's not make a scene about it. Uh, that's possible. We already saw, I think, one instance where uh, that was the case in, in one of these earlier ones where it would be better to be wronged rather than to fight, as it were, for your rights and somehow bring aspersion uh, on the gospel. But others see this rather as referring to the one you just gave that, that money to, that we're in need. Don't give it to them with a the string attached to it. Don't be like the world that gives in order to receive it back or even to receive it back with interest, but rather give it to them and let them have it. Do not expect it back. Just as Jesus, who when he gave, did not expect repayment. When he gives to us everything that he gives to us, he doesn't say, I want you to pay me back, but he says, I freely give you all these things. They are yours, purely of grace. Now we, we thank him for that, and we serve him for that, but we can never repay him for that. What Jesus desires is that the one who receives would rather give praise to God and worship him by doing what he calls him to do, which would be to give somebody else who is in need. And so our Lord is telling us here that we are to give. Give in the name of Jesus and don't expect to receive it back. He says the bottom line basically in verse 31 is this, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. We should do for others what we want them to do for us if they were in our situation. That certainly requires empathy. The Lord wants us to descend, as it were, into their need, to feel their pain, to imagine, you know, imagine what it is they're going through. He's given us an imagination so we can do that, put ourselves in their situation so we can see what it is that we would want to be done for us if we were in that same situation and then knowing what we would like to try to meet those needs, but better yet, we should try to treat them and meet their needs in the way we know Jesus would, in the way that he did for us. Again, let's just remember what Jesus did for us. We were his enemies, but he came for us. He lived for us. He died for us. He was raised for us. He ascended into heaven for us. And now in heaven, he continues to serve us by, again, ruling and overruling all things for his glory, protecting us, providing for us. He gave to us as his enemies so that we might live, not just physically, but spiritually forever. The Lord says we should give to others so that they might live as well, not just physically, but spiritually. So let's not forget the main reason that God calls us to love our enemies. It's so that we might lead them to Him. I think this is what Jesus means when He says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The way that we shine the light of God's love is by doing good works and doing it in such a way that they glorify your Father who is in heaven. And again, I believe that your light sh never shines any brighter than when you're loving your enemies with a love that clearly costs you something. 
If you're willing to do this, the Lord is saying you may very well be the instrument that he uses to bring those enemies to glorify him by their coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there's a whole parable devoted to this very subject, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan didn't help his friend. The Good Samaritan helped his enemy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. May the Lord help us then to be Good Samaritans to our enemies and to love them with a love that gives in order that they might come to glorify God. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to be able to do this. We can only do it by His grace.